Transscience Corporation. This is Greg speaking. How can I help you? My name is Kion Wolf. Uh, I'm nine years old, and I live in Farmington, um, Connecticut, and I saw your ad for Sea Monkeys on the back of my Wonder Woman comic book, so, um, so I sent in the money I earned selling grit newspapers, and when I got them, they're not like they were, you know, on the comic book. Sure they are, kid. They're just little tiny shrimp. They, they don't really have cute monkey faces at all or anything. That's how they look to each other, kid. If you were a sea monkey looking at another sea monkey, that's how that sea monkey would look to you. But it says in the comic book, so eager to please, they can even be trained. Have they complained about sitting in a fish tank all day? N no. They're easy to please. Have they pooped in the house yet? Of course not. Then they're housebroken. You already trained them. Look, kid, I gotta go. The Nobel Prize for science people are on the other line. But, wait, uh, I'm only nine years old. I, I didn't realize people could lie to me like this, especially in Wonder Woman comic books. How into Wonder Woman are you? I love everything about her. Give it five years, kid. Then see if you're telling everybody the truth about everything. I don't understand. You will. Hello, hello? Oh. So, is that it? Is truth a straight line, or is truth a, a curving, rolling, undulating surface like the body of Wonder Woman? I need a moment. Today's show is about lying. And now his radio show will make you rich and sexy. Colin McEnroe. <laughs> I love both the nine-year-old Kion Wolf and Greg Hill's huckster voice. All right, we are talking about lying today. And so much of growing up really is that process, right? That process of, of understanding that not everything you, that you, will, you are being told is true. For me, uh, one of the uh, moments of scales falling from my eyes uh, was the advent of Mad Magazine in my life, where Mad Magazine really introduced this incredibly subversive truth, in particular that things and advertisements were not true. Nine, of, nine out of 13 dentists don't really tell you that. Uh, there is no such thing as waxy yellow buildup, nor is there a product that gets rid of it. That, like, there was just this incredible cloud of falsehoods in which I was dwelling. And I just, I, that had not occurred to me, really, that people in, people in authority were lying to me. Now, you could sort of say that the journey of our own nation, our own society, kind of parallels that. Um, later in the show, we'll talk about one of the turning points, which I, I think was in 1960, the downing of the U-2 plane by the, it was a spy plane down by the Soviets. The Eisenhower administration uh, put out a lie, which uh, President Eisenhower himself subscribed to publicly. And it was shocking to people when it, when it turned out to be a lie, when it was revealed to be a lie. The American public was shocked by the notion that an American president was intentionally telling a lie. I think, in a way, we've moved from that childhood to an adolescence, a cynical adolescence, in which we assume that we're being lied to a lot of the time. But this isn't a new idea either. Uh, I also remember as an adolescent reading Gulliver's Travels, in which Swift uh, creates this uh, race of super intelligent, hyper ethical horses, the Winnems. And the Winnems don't even have a word for lying in their language. They call it, uh, let's see, the thing which is not. When you lie, you say the thing which is not. And I remember having my mind blown by that, you know, that there would be a culture that just didn't need a word for lying because nobody lied. Uh, all right, so that's what we're talking about today. We're talking first of all, first of all, about the philosophical status of lying. Then we're going to talk about how lying does play out across the landscape uh, of historical events, uh, of our own lives, of of events in the news, uh, in our history. And then, lastly, in in a weird way, at the end, we're going to kind of go back to the beginning and talk about um, how. Uh, how we evolved, how we evolved as a species, and to what degree, to what degree, deception, the ability to deceive, played a role in creating early cooperative societies, hominid societies, uh, in which you know people acted on behalf of one another. Uh, either we were marvelously altruistic hominids, or chances are somebody had to lie to somebody else to get them to do certain things. Anyway, we'll give you a little bit of actual science on that too. So let me tell you who's here. In studio is Michael Lynch, a professor of philosophy at University of Connecticut, a director of the Humanities Institute there, too. He's been with us many times before, uh, but he's the perfect guy today, and many of his books do dr deal with truth and deception. His latest to be published uh, is The Knowledge Machine, Knowing More and Understanding Less in the Era of Big Data, the Age of Big Data, and we will be talking uh, later on, probably in the second segment, about um, how life uh, in our digital age changes or amplifies uh, issues around lying. Um, also with us right now, Sam Harris, author of uh, several books uh, that are relevant to this, including Lying and the Moral Landscape. 
Uh, he holds a degree in philosophy from Stanford and doctorate in neuroscience from UCLA. Uh, and a little, little later on, we'll introduce you to a couple more guests who will get us into some of the other areas I talk, talk about. But let's start right there in the stark reality of, uh, of philosophy, and uh, assuming that's a place where there's stark reality. I'm not even sure that's true. Um, so, M- Michael Lynch, uh, let's just begin with the, whole, with the word lie, all right? I mean, every word has a definition. So how do we define the word lie? Well, there, um, thanks, Colin. Mm. I, I, it, there's a, a couple different ways that people have de- uh, defined lying over the years, but I think most of them come down to pretty much of a, a simple uh, overlapping definition, and that is to lie is to say something with the in, uh, that you don't believe with the intention of deceiving or being deceptive. Uh, so it's, you know, actors on the stage, they say things that uh, are not true about themselves, for example, when they're playing a, a role, but uh, they're not lying because they're not intending to deceive because it's all part of a make-believe world which the audience is already bought into. And, um, of course, deception can be bigger than lying, too. I mean, you can, you can deceive or attempt to deceive without, you know, saying anything. But lying is, you know, first comes the word then comes the lie. Lying is about language. It's interesting you mentioned acting. Uh, Brando said, if you can lie, you can act. Uh, but you're right. It's a different thing. And it's probably a different thing, too. If I tell you, no, Mike, I'm not giving you an iPhone 6 or whatever the latest iPhone is for Christmas because I want you to be so surprised and delighted on Christmas Day. Do we call that a lie? It's, I, I am intentionally deceiving you, but I'm not deceiving you for my benefit, I don't think. I'm deceiving you so that you'll be that much happier when uh, the truth comes out. Well, that, that's one of those uh, famous border areas. I mean, or think of another, uh, uh, quote, lie that's going ar- around right now in lots of households around the, around the world, uh, you know, uh, lies about Santa. Uh, we right? don't wanna, well, we right? don't want to. We don't want to. There may be children. I was going to get to that. I was going to get to that. But I think we need, sorry. To get, we need to get there obliquely. That, that's okay. Okay. Um, sorry about that. Of course, I, the lie that he's referring to <laughs> is that Santa's already <laughs> left the North Pole. Santa doesn't leave the North Pole. Of course. Until absolutely the very last minute on the day of Christmas Eve. So, um, but, but we will get to that. But we'll just sort of get it to a, about in a roundabout way, just in case there's anybody driving around with kids in the car. Uh, all right. So um, let's add Sam Harris to this. Uh, and so we've talked, you know, uh, Michael Lynch and I have just talked about, um, you know, sort of the, the gray area lie, the lie, the, the lie about a Christmas present that's actually meant to enhance a person's enjoyment uh, later. Now, setting those kinds of things in, aside, the benign untruth is uh, and, and looking at all the other kinds of lies, are, are those kinds of lies almost inevitably, maybe even categorically bad well, you know, I'm not so eager. Well, first, let me say thanks for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. Um, uh, I'm not so eager to set those kinds of uh, so-called white lies aside, uh, or you know, the or I mean, that's even that's the whitest example of a white lie. I and mean, the white lie is usually in response to something like, "Do I look fat in this dress?" But um, Santa and the uh, you know, surprise parties and other um, uh, lies that seem calculated to just produce pleasure in those we love. I think those come at a, at a cost too. So I, you know, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't take those off the table. I think there's, you know, when you have a, um, I mean, one of the the indelible messages of a successfully wrought surprise party is that the people closest to you can successfully lie to your face if it if it comes to that. I mean, it's possible to bring off a surprise party without finding that you have to lie, but. But in many cases, you're 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 forcing people to lie to the people closest to them, and um, it's sort of unnerving to see that uh, happen. Well, uh, and I think it's I think it's there's something corrosive about it, and I, I wouldn't um, you know you may not, you want may want to go to less controversial territory, but. I think all I think we pay a price for all of these lies. Um, no, I'll stay in controversial territory. So the the price that you're describing is kind of a a, a cost. Uh, assessed against sort of our, our, our interpersonal social covenants and our vast social covenants. In other words, if I can lie to you about your surprise party, if I can look you in the face and tell you I'm actually taking you to the hardware store uh, when, in fact, I'm taking you to your, your 50th birthday party, um, that means that I can lie, right? And and so our relationship has shifted onto a ground of untruth, and and, and not at a Kantian level, right, uh, 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 of just categorical wrong, a moral code that exists whether we know about it or not. Not, but it's some other 
measure measurement of, of 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 our social health you're saying there's an injury being committed yeah and these injuries can be quite subtle but but decisive and also unacknowledged but there's an example i i uh, use in my book i went out to readers of of my blog and asked them for examples of white lies that they felt were were consequential to them and, and one that was fascinating to me that i used in my book came back um there were two friends hanging out, and uh, you know, one um, realized that she had a plan later in the evening with a with a third friend that she didn't want to keep, and so, and so she asked her the friend who she was with to just hold on a second, and she picked up her cell phone, and she called friend number two and left her a voicemail message, uh, which was a just a stark lie. She said, you know, I got sorry, I can't go out tonight. I you know, the kid, one of my kids is sick, and you know, so we'll have to reschedule. And witnessing her friend. Uh, tell a lie with such alacrity and and uh so convincingly uh, actually harmed the the relationship she because she wondered how many times she had been on the receiving end of such a lie uh, she never said anything to her friend because there was no it was it was it really wasn't her place it wasn't the kind of relationship she, where she was going to browbeat her her friend about her ethics but she just witnessed her friend tell a lie to another friend uh without a qualm and I, and and she 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 felt the pride. I mean, she, she going forward now for decades, she has always kept this friend on a different footing, simply because she knows she'll lie when it suits her purpose. And and that's, I think we're we're in, you know, many people are inured to this kind of thing. But when you sensitize yourself to it, it it really is it's quite a relief to have people in your life who you know will not lie to you. Uh, in fact, who who you know on some level cannot lie to you. And you know, I, those are the kinds of relationships I really value. Um, I, I might be, uh, Michael, in shifting this onto uh, uh, the ground uh, where there's a lot of philosophical rabbit holes, but just for the hell of it. Um, what's so great about the truth? I mean, Nietzsche said that truth was kind of overrated, I'm paraphrasing here, but there was like an ever-shifting army of social metaphors, and that our only real affirmation of the truth comes from society, not from some kind of platonic ideal or Kantian categorical imperative, that we were really kind of swearing allegiance to, to something that we would have a lot of trouble quantifying when we talk about truth. So respond to that. What's so great about the truth? What's great about the truth is uh, can be revealed by thinking about another facet of uh, deception. I mean, one of the things about uh, uh, deception is that the deceiver gets between you and the facts. And that's an exercise of power. And one of the, and and that's what I, I in part of what I think Sam was getting at. We don't expect our loved ones to exercise power in that way over us to get between ourselves and the way the world is. And the reason that is uncomfortable is because, of course, the way the world is responding to how it is is an important feature for for being able to get around successfully in the world. And when people get in the way of that, when they exercise some power so as to uh, get between you and the facts, as I put it. Uh, they're, in a sense, also robbing you of some power to deal with that reality. So the, the virtue of, of, of speaking the truth and, and being sincere is that it, uh, it, it is a way of acknowledging the power of, as it were, the facts, the world in itself, and uh, opening yourself up to that and being able to deal with things as they are. Um, Sam Harris, some people, I would argue, are not entitled to the truth from me. For example, uh, if you, Sam Harris, are waterboarding me uh, or torturing me in some way, uh, I feel as though um, I can lie to you without committing any particular moral harm. Yes? Yeah, yeah I would agree. I, I think lies fall on a continuum of violence that, that in which there are ethical cases to uh, resort to it. So, you know, in any situation where you would punch someone in the face to, in self-defense, you could certainly lie to them as a lesser use of force, uh, and but th th these are these are situations where relationships have broken down or not been established. These are situations where you're you, you you're not faced with a a rational collaborator uh, with whom you can have a common project. And I, I think Michael's uh, formulation of it a moment ago was very useful and actually exposes what is so problematic about so-called white lies. Because when you're when you're lying to someone. Uh, even in the in the whitest case, when you when you seem to be uh, motivated by compassion, and and you you, you know, so so for instance, to take the prototypical, do I look fat in this dress? Um, you 
most people think, well, you just, of course you can't say, yes, I'm sorry to say you do look fat in that dress, if in fact you think they do, because that's just that's a horrible thing to say to a friend, and who you know, you're going to lose all your friends if you do that. Uh, but the reality is, is you are, if you, if you view the world that way, of course you, you can be honest and say that you're just expressing your opinion, if in fact you think your opinion is, you know, just, uh, you know, could be idiosyncratic, but... Um, so if somebody asks you, "Do you like my screenplay or do you like my novel?" You can say, "Listen, I'm not a you know I'm not a Nobel laureate in literature, but the, the, here's my impression of it." And so you, you can you can offer whatever caveats you you want. But if you when you are denying someone your view of reality, you are exercising a certain kind of power and a certain kind of arrogance because you are basically saying that you are a better judge of what they should know about their lives than they are. You are in a position of, of even when you when you believe your intentions are good, you are you are denying them access to a reality that, that presumably you would want access to if you were in their shoes. Uh, so, so do, how eager are you to walk out of your house looking fat in a dress when even your best friend thinks you look fat in it, being told you don't look fat in it, uh, and that that's the situation you're putting your friends in when you're denying them um, uh, your view of the world. What about, I mean, uh, Michael, it seems as though Sam's um, example, though, it, it assumes kind of a flat playing field. So, and, and obviously the example that I gave before is the most tilted possible playing field. If you're torturing me, then you're not entitled to the truth from me. But let's take a, a little bit more familiar to some people playing field. So uh, I just read a, an op-ed piece a, a few weeks ago in the New York Times by Peter Pomerantsev, who's a guy who writes about Russia. I think he's got a book out about Russia right now, uh, contrasting today's generation living under Putin, who... I, uh, let's posit for a moment that Putin and his uh, henchmen manipulate reality all the time for the purposes of propaganda. And, but he also contrasts that to the generation born b before 1991, who grew up in, in real Soviet era, you know, state controlled truth, where he argues people really kind of developed alternative selves almost that in order to navigate this world, this kind of Kafka esque world where white was frequently uh, presented as black by the society in which you live, live becoming being a Sam Harris absolutist about this being an essentially truthful person was not only not in, in your best interest but it wasn't even a real rational response to your to your daily circumstances in the state in which you live so um, so, so Michael tackle that one for me well I think what, what you're getting at is uh, the fact that what what how a lie uh, is an exercise of power and whether that exercise of power is, as it were, excusable or permissible can really depend on the context that you are in. And if you're in a context where people are lying to you all the time and you are sort of aware that there is this level of deception going on and there are, there are grave prices to be paid by, for calling them out on this, right? You'll be sent to the gulag, so to speak. Then uh, you're going to be in a situation where Playing with the truth yourself will be an attempt to engage, like some keep some power for yourself to protect yourself from uh, the massive deception that's going on on a, all around you. I mean, one one thing though to follow up about something like that. I mean, and this is I think relevant to the society we live in, not 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 just uh, uh, Russia uh, at any point. But uh, one thing to keep in mind is when there's a massive amount of deception going on at the uh, governmental level. People begin to feel, and, and, and that starts to be recognized, then it's not even clear at that point whether the deception is, it's deception, but whether it's lying per se, because it's not even really clear uh, that the government is, uh, is expecting you to take what they say seriously. <laughs> they're, what they're actually trying to do is to say that, look, the line between tr uh, what's true and what's false is in a sense up to us. There, there's, a great, there's a great part of 1984 where you know, Winston's being tortured to go back to torture for some reason, um, where you know, uh, O'Brien's trying to get him to uh, admit that two and two uh, doesn't equal four. And what he says at one point, O'Brien, that is, says to Winston, he says, look, what you have to understand is what the party says is the truth is the truth. That's the thing you have to understand. And I think one, one of the things that's really problematic about widespread governmental deception is, whether it's lying uh, technically or not, 
is that it tends to get people to become skeptical about the, there being such a thing as objective truth. And in fact, people, you know, governments can sometimes deliberately try to get you to see that there isn't much of a difference so as to make it easier to manipulate you. Uh, it's, it's hard also not to think about, you know, Suskin's uh, story uh, w- where he interviewed Karl Rove. The reality-based community. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Well, you know, I mean, so, Sam, I want you to address this a little bit, too. I mean, there's a the whole question of lying to liars, right, P- people who are lying to you already. And, and so, you know, it doesn't have to be Russian under, Russia under Putin. It can be anywhere. Any regime which on a daily basis puts out lies for the purposes uh, of exercising greater control uh, over its populace. Well, you know, Michael says, well, in some ways that could be a joke that everybody's in on. Um, but it's also the case that a lot of these regimes simply do say up is down, black is white, our policy in, in Crimea is is moral and effective and for the benefit of the people there or what it, whatever. And, and a possible response to that is, well, I'll just never tell the truth about what I think. I will, in fact, lie about what I think, not because I'll be sent to the gulag, but because it just I won't function effectively in this society if I'm constantly telling the truth. And I don't feel bad about it because they're never telling the truth. Yeah, well, again, I think there are situations where lying is ethically warranted, and these are really what I would call self-defense situations where, you know, violence might be warranted, theft might be warranted, uh, and lying might be warranted because you're here. But here you're really talking about the ethics of moral emergency. I mean, these are not situations that anyone should aspire to live in. And insofar as we find our own society meandering toward uh, that kind of social pathology, we should be very worried about it. And well, I think, let me just uh, let me just I, I just to put it on a more gray area, though, just because I think that's more interesting for you to talk about. So let's say it's not moral urgency. Let's just say that you know I I'm better off saying I think Putin's doing a great job if I live in Russia. I may actually think he's doing a terrible job, and and maybe you would say it's morally incumbent on me to dissent from his policies, particularly if I'm not facing violent reprisals. Let's just posit that too. I'm not going to go to the gulag. I'm not going to get thrown in jail. Although tell Pussy Riot that, but I mean, um, you know, I'm just going to have a harder time. Do I have a moral obligation to tell the truth about what I think? Well, again, this is still in a. You're still talking about a situation where uh, society and social institutions uh, have been fundamentally corrupted. That where, where the incentives are aligned in such a way as to encourage the bad behavior and non-collaboration of everyone uh and that and that's you know the only way to 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 move forward is you know to and, and execute your own projects is to to more or less treat everyone and society itself as an enemy and that's uh that's problematic and that's you know and, and so we should just recognize that's what's going on i mean what the, the, the crystalline case of this is you know what is it like to be sent to a maximum security prison in any country, uh, United States included? Uh, well, you, you find yourself in a situation where all the incentives are wrong. You, 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 you know, if you're a, if you're a white guy sent to a maximum security prison, you might not have a racist bone in your body, but the only rational thing for you to do is to hang out with the other white guys who are you know, racist skinheads. Otherwise, everyone's going to prey on you. And so, yeah, so you're, you're talking about. Um, uh, situations where incentives are aligned in such a way that even good people find it very, very difficult to behave well, and you have to be some kind of moral hero to to even attempt to behave well. And what we what we really want, I think, and what will move humanity's you know common projects the furthest, is to create institutions and and systems of incentives where it becomes easier and easier for even mediocre people. To behave very well, we don't want we don't want systems where you have to be a hero just to be a decent human being, uh, and and that's and, and many people unfortunately live in those contexts. All right, I got to take a break here. I'll get in a lot of trouble. I actually have like a whole other bunch of things I want to ask you about, but we'll all have to go out to uh, for out for coffee or something. Anyway, uh, we'll take a quick break. We'll come back with more of our lying show. It's just a standard form tomorrow without fail. Pleased to meet you. Thanks a lot. Your check is in the mail. Lies. Marooned, marooned, marooned in a blizzard of lies. When is it okay to lie? I think it's okay to bend the truth if you're making a higher point. When you're not going to hurt someone. 
If somebody asks, how do I look in this dress? Do you want to say that you look lousy or you look fat? No, you wouldn't say that. You'd say you look great. It's never okay to lie. Because you'll always get caught. Never. It just causes hurt and problems to lie. I guess it depends on the situation. Awkward situations. A small lie is okay if it's protecting somebody or making them feel better. In bed. If you're lying in bed, sleeping. <laughs> That's a nice play on words. <laughs> Never. Except about Santa Claus. Have you ever been caught in a lie? No, I'm pretty sneaky kid. Is that a lie? No. <laughs> no, no, it's just little white lies. I've caught my kids in lies, and yes, they did pay the consequences. And they turned out to be better human beings for it. What was the punishment? A year of community service in West Hartford when he was a senior in high school. And now he's an attorney and a father of three. So it worked out. What should be the punishment for lying? Go to your room. Unfortunately, the worst part of getting caught in a lie is you're probably never trusted again. Depends how bad the lie is, too. All right, those are Voices from the Streets, collected by our own Katie Pikus. Uh, we're talking about lies today. Michael Lynch and Sam Harris are both with us. Uh, joining us also is Ralph Kyes, Ralph Kyes, lecturer, essayist, and author of uh, many relevant books, including The Post-Truth Era, Dishonesty and Deception in Contemporary Life. Uh, that gets right back to what uh, Michael was talking about before with the famous uh, line about the you're part of the reality-based community, allegedly spoken by Karl Rove, as though that were some kind of separate community from from the race of humankind. Um, so, um, Ralph Kaiser, uh, uh, I want to talk about this. I want to talk about um, uh, whether there's been some kind of pivot uh, over the decades in how we perceive this question of being lied to in public contexts. And I, I referenced earlier, for me, not that I have a conscious memory of this, but for me, uh, in 1960, uh, Gary Powers is in his U-2 plane. He got shot down over Russia, uh, and essentially uh, the Eisenhower administration lied about this and said it was, a, I think, a NASA weather research flight or something. And they got caught. They eventually got caught and were, were forced to publicly admit that they had lied about this. And this was really regarded with shock by the American public, that the president had put his reputation behind a lie. Um, and, and, and even even a lie that, that maybe had some kind of significant purpose or at least kind of reinforcing the overall uh, safety of the American people or whatever rationale you'd want to – didn't make any difference. And supposedly Eisenhower even thought about resigning because he had lied. Um, and, and I feel as though even 10 years later that wouldn't be the case. Have we kind of changed our definition about what's acceptable lying to us? Oh, I believe we have, not not just in terms of – what's acceptable lying to us, but what's acceptable lying that we can engage in. And, and how do you feel, how would you describe that change? Well, I think we're a very clever people, uh, very smart, and the smarter and better educated we get, the, the more capable we are of rationalizing uh, uh, dishonesty, uh, even when it's not just you know a little lie for, for the sake of convenience, but sometimes uh, major types of dishonesty. Uh, you had um, Paul DeMann there at, uh, at Yale in yep. the English department who turned out to, to be a uh, <laughs> a world-class liar about his background as a neo-Nazi in Belgium and any number of other things. And yet even when he was unmasked, un unfortunately after he had uh, died, uh, many of his colleagues still wanted to defend him as, as a man of, of basic integrity and someone who was pursuing higher truths, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's and, a I, I hadn't – was somebody about to talk? Did I just interrupt somebody? I thought I heard a voice. That's a great place to go because – okay, so that, that's an interesting environment. Uh, we, uh, we, we really wanted to do a show about this a long time ago, and it never mm -hmm. happened. But mm -hmm. So in that case, one of the arguments that was made by Derrida and other scholars who were uh, supporters of, of demand was – is fundamentally a just deconstructionist argument. They were all believers in this notion that I couldn't even possibly begin to, to, to summarize here, but, but essentially that the truth was a much more fungible concept right. and, and a much more complicated interaction between text and reader uh, than had previously been acknowledged. Right. And so is that just a stark rationalization, or are, are there certain fish tanks that we swim in where the rules are different? Well, to well, me, I think it, it, one one aspect of that is that it sort of points to everything that's intellectually wrong with with that trend in continental philosophy. It's just that to to imagine that the truth is so context dependent 
and so fungible as to be, you know, an ever moving target that you that you really you don't even have the burden of honesty uh, with which to try to get a hold of it. I mean, that's just you know that that upends more or less everything we care about intellectually. It certainly destroys science if you were going to follow follow uh, Derrida uh, and um, the rest down that rabbit hole. And um, it's uh, you know interpersonally, uh, I, I think it's disastrous. It's just not where you want to be with the closest people in your life. And I mean the, the very measure of, of their closeness to you is your willingness to share with them your actual vision of reality and then the question is well how do you want two ethical codes do you want the do you want one way you treat uh, the people who you're close to and another way you treat strangers and clients and business associates or do you basically want to be committed to honesty across the board and i would i would argue that you you really want just one ethical code. It's not to say that you ha- you you have to imagine some intimacy with strangers that doesn't exist, but every stranger is a potential friend, and and you can be if you have two ethical codes, you can be uh, continually blindsided by um, uh, you know a a, a a a mismatch between your expectations that you're in one code as opposed to the other. And the classic well, case is. You know, you're in a store uh, shopping for some product, and the salesman is is giving you some some dishonest misrepresentation of its virtues. But then you discover in the middle of the conversation that that oh, you know, you actually know this guy. He's the brother of a close friend of yours, and and the the, the conversation switch switches to the footing of, of friendship suddenly. And then you get a different story from All right. him. I just, I, just wanna, I, just, I just want to pause and just weave um, Ralph and, and, and Michael yeah. back into this conversation, Sam. So, I mean, Ralph, one of the questions then becomes, what's the change? In other words, was there a chivalric code that, that people subscribed to uh, and then stopped subscribing to? Or is it simply the case that people started getting caught a lot more? Uh, in other words, you know, during Vietnam, during the Vietnam War, there were a lot of questions being asked about body counts and, and questions about whether we were being told the truth about anything regarding the Vietnam War. And we became a more questioning society and people got caught in their lives. In, in the case of Watergate, once again, we had a president uh, and his henchmen being caught in this incredible web of lies. And so the question would be, was the lying always going on for decades and centuries uh, and the apprehension of it uh, simply got ratcheted up? Or did we actually get worse as a society? I think the will the will to lie has always been there. In other words, I don't think we're any less ethical by nature than we were 500 or 1,000 years ago. But I think because we live in more anonymous contexts, because we're more mobile, uh, we're not in nearly as much risk of of being you know found out by our friends and neighbors and relatives as we were several centuries ago. So it's much you know it, as the old cartoon goes, there's a dog pounding on a keyboard and saying on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. And so we have all these these ways of of kind of hiding. Uh, uh, our 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 our, uh, our deceptions that we didn't have in previous years, particularly in the with the uh, with the internet, but I think it also reflects a a shift of consciousness. Uh, my last book was on euphemisms. It was called Euphemania, and in it I had lists and lists, and, and I, I want to just share a few of ways that we. Um, rationalize uh, our lying or that we you know we never want to say we're lying we say we alter the truth we bamboozle we buff we burnish we dissemble we embroider the truth we equivocate we exaggerated a little we fictionalized we fabricated we inflated the truth a, a bit we uh, we misrepresented oh i misspoke i misstated i uh, i made a bad decision i puffed oh, I, 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 as Tommy ashbrook would say i hear you, i hear you on that okay. the, 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 the euphemisms i just want to quickly my, go i want to my, favorite, go, my yeah. favorite one was a psychiatrist saying that one of his clients was someone for whom the truth was temporarily unavailable <laughs> i like that i might even yeah. use that well so mike michael lynch you know since your uh, most recent book is about uh, big data and the digital age so the the point that ralph Kaiser is making is an interesting one, which is that 
you know, one of the things we got to see during the growth of Internet culture is how people act when they think they can't be held accountable, when they think they're anonymous. And what did we get? We got phishing, the PH kind of phishing. We got catfishing. We got uh, we got Nigerian bank scams and every other kind of spam scam out there. This is an argument for the total depravity of humankind, right? That when people think that they can lie and, and experience few, if any, consequences, they're going to lie their butts off. Well, look, lying like breathing comes natural to human beings. So I agree that, you know, things it's not that people, in a sense, have a greater propensity to lie, but they do have a greater opportunity to do that exactly. now. Um, that's the that's the point that uh, I think really needs to be emphasized. And uh, look, there's two either. You mentioned the, the fact that, you know, on the Internet and on social media, we can, um, if we wish, be anonymous. We can use a fault, fake identity. Uh, we can misrepresent ourselves. We can also sculpt our identity. And, and that's a really great thing about, let's say, social media and using it to sculpt a political point or to emphasize things. You know, people use Twitter right now as a, as a you know, in a, in a really cool way to advocate for their political causes. But, of course, it's very tempting to try to sculpt the truth uh, in a way that or sculpt your message in a way that, in, that will, you think, you know, resonate with the, the greater amount of, uh, of folks. And so, in a, you know, this greater opportunity to, to uh, get your message out there is also a greater opportunity to distort what's true and uh, to convince yourself that it's, uh, it's absolutely okay to engage in what, um, uh, you know, to lie for, a, uh, as one of the, the people that was interviewed on the segment just before this, you know, said, uh, well, you know, it's okay perhaps to lie if it's for the greater good. That's the idea of the noble lie. And the noble lie, that, that concept is all over the place right now. Uh, the idea that people, you know, people think that, well, you know, even if this isn't exactly true or if I don't even know it's true, I'm going to post that because it gets my point across vis-a-vis uh, -vis my, you know, uh, political standpoint or my personal standpoint. So again, the, the issue here is, is that there's, a, there's just greater opportunity for communication. And when there's greater opportunity for communication, then to get back to what I said, if it's lying is something that does come uh, naturally to people, then there's going to be a greater opportunity and, to lie. Um, Sam Harris, there's another kind of line that goes on. It's something that uh, Ralph also mentioned to us, I think, in the pre-interviews for the show. That's kind of interesting where you have you see it on television a lot. The, the daily on the Daily Show correspondents will often um, adopt a posture that is not really their own just to see what an unsuspecting interviewee will say when he thinks uh, he's in the presence of a sympathetic ear. You see it also with Sasha Baron Cohen's characters uh, like Ali G and Borat. There's a completely horrifying moment in um, in the Borat movie where where he's uh, singing to a bunch of people in a country western bar, and he sings this incredibly anti-Semitic song from supposedly his home in Kazakhstan, and it's Throw the Jew Down the Well, and you have all these people who start to sing along with him. Okay, he's effectively lying to them, and a lot of times the Daily Show correspondents are kind of lying about who they are or how seriously they, they take um, a person's point of view, but it's often for the purpose of, of eliciting things from that person that that person wouldn't say under more hostile or even neutral questioning. So how do we ev evaluate that behavior as lying? Yeah, well, I think those are, are genuinely gray areas. Of, it it, it de definitely grades into the ethics of performance where, as we've said, de deception is really not the issue. You, you, you don't, you're not going to... Uh, uh, think worse of stage magicians and actors, uh, etc., for for um, deceiving you uh, because it's part of the game. And I, I, frankly, I don't know how those ambush interviews are conducted. I, c I can certainly imagine that they, um, at the end of the day, uh, their their victims feel truly victimized and deceived. And uh, I'm, you know, I, I always marvel at the fact that they they sign the release. If they feel that way and allow the the uh, thing to air, but um, many of those, uh, you know, I think the, the the throw the Jew down the well uh, uh, scene, which uh, you know uh, I think everyone thought was hilarious, uh, as did I. It, it, that that doesn't really rise to the level of a lie so much as a piece of performance art that is making a rather devastating point and revealing some uh, uh, bigotry that that everyone suspected was there. So I, I, one thing, one point I would make to pick up on what was just said, though, was that technology is really cutting both ways for us. It, it does give us an opportunity to lie uh, 
more and and to to operate behind the veil of anonymity and to and to spread lies more widely but it also uh offers an opportunity to uh debunk lies and it it's it's harder to get away with certain kinds of misrepresentation certainly consequential ones now i think because you know, you just you just see what happens when you try to plagiarize something now. I mean, people, you have you have an army of fact checkers uh, who are happy to do the unpaid work of checking your words. And you know, now with with you know online tools, it's just it, it is trivially easy to catch someone misrepresenting their past or you know, trying to bury it uh, or stealing the the intellectual property of another person. And I think that's. That's to the good. It's sort of an arms race, though. The liars try to get better, and we try to get better at catching them. All right, we have to take a quick break here. Uh, we're going to come back with more of Michael Lynch. We're, you're gonna, thanks so much to Ralph Kaiser and to Sam Harris. Uh, we're going to come back with Luke McNally. I want to get back to the sort of the origins. You know, are we fundamentally untruth? Are we wired for untruth after this? Going into a lot of details, does it really seem fair that Santa Claus would punish you for making things up? Today's show was produced by Josh Nalea and me, Kyone Wolf. Greg Hill appeared in the intro and tweets for us at WNPR Colin. Our interns are Katie Pikus and Kate McAuliffe. The part of Bill Curry was played by John Lovitz. For show pages, articles, and real untouched photos of the Faith Middleton Show staff dancing naked around a Christmas tree, yeah, that's the ticket. Visit our website, WNPR.org. On tomorrow's show, our search for the next great Christmas song. And now, back to Colin. So uh, maybe we should have had this conversation at the beginning. I, I don't know. But it, we'll, we'll, we'll do it now. We'll go back. Because one of the interesting questions is, okay, what's our wiring? Um, let's assume that there isn't some categorical pre-existing Kantian code against uh, lying. Uh, or even if there is one, that we existed uh, at a time as a species when we couldn't possibly have known about it. What were we doing then? Uh, so to talk about that, we still have Michael Lynch. Uh, but we're also going to uh, Luke McNally, researcher at Trinity College in Dublin, studying behavioral evolution and biodiversity. He's the co-author of the article, Cooperation Creates Selection for Tactical Deception, uh, published by the Royal Society of London. If I were uh, better at statistics, I would have understood it better. Uh, but uh, in fact, he's going to help us out anyway. So Luke McNally, as I understand it, one of the questions that you were really exploring there, there is maybe in a, a prehistoric hominid society or human society, um, would there be some reason why lying or deceiving other members of, the, uh, of a cooperative group would be adaptive, would be so adaptive that uh, maybe your genes would be passed forward more in a more rapid or profuse way than somebody who wasn't good at deceiving? Am I, first of all, stating one of your questions correctly? Um, yes, yes. So I suppose we are trying to understand what what could have led to selection for our abilities to deceive each other um, yeah, in our ancestors. Um, and I suppose we were interested in, well, what kind of society leads to this environment that selects for an ability to deceive others? And um, I suppose one interesting idea that we came forward was that well, maybe it's cooperation, maybe it's people being nice to each other that actually drove selection for our ability to lie to each other. Um, so that that's kind of what we've been exploring. So one of, the, one of our previous guests used the example. The example that gets used all the time, and obviously this probably would not apply to, say, a hominid society, but uh, someone asking you, do I look fat in this dress? Uh, and the correct answer is never yes. Um, but the socially disruptive answer is the truth, if in fact the person does look fat in that dress. Um, so is that one of the things you're looking at? In other words, that, that truth, constant truth-telling, as opposed to eliciting cooperation through maybe some misstatement of fact, um, that, that the latter would be more effective than the former? Um, yeah, so I suppose what we're really looking at is, okay, how could you avoid paying the cost of cooperation um, and, and using deception as a tool to do that? So the way cooperation has evolved in primates and humans is um, by 
we kind of have a hardwired rule of reciprocity. So I, I'm i nice to people who are nice to me. Mm. And that's kind of the rule that has evolved. And so deception is a way around this. If I can misrepresent my actions so it seems like I'm nice, people will be nice to me. And that's kind of the basic idea of, of what we were looking at, that it's a way of avoiding the cost of having to help others um, by by making it look like you're helping others. So, um, uh, so Michael Lynch, there's sort of a philosophical question underlying this, too, and it really is does get back to our natures. You know, do, what's what's our default setting here? And, and so, uh, you know, there's been one study I saw recently that indicated that we're more likely to impulsively lie towards the end of the day when we're more we're tired, we're cognitively tired, which suggests that it re- takes some cognitive effort to be truthful all the time, which would further suggest that left to our own devices, we would impulsively lie for gain anyway, more more often maybe than we do. So, Michael Lynch, as a philosopher, when you explore this, I mean, first of all, is that an interesting question to you? Well, I think it is. Inter- there's an interesting question, two, two interesting questions here. One uh, that Luke brings up is just this issue of, well, what what what's the sort of uh, benefit um, to lying? What is it that it gets you? And the way I had of putting that earlier is that it, it gives you some power. It, put, you know, it allows you to get between uh, the facts and uh, and the person you're lying to, and possibly for, uh, you know, in order to uh, get along with them and not have to deal with uh, the cost of cooperation, but also uh, just for, you know, more straightforward reasons. It's just that you want them to do something for you, for example. Um, look, uh, as far as whether we're, you know, hardwired to lie, that's an empirical question. So I think that's really a question that, you know, is, is and it's it's also, I mean, it's a hard, it, it, it's perhaps even particularly unclear because it's not clear what it means to be hard, hardwired uh, to do something so complex as lying. Well, lying I'm, involves a lot of different things. Let me right? stop you there because, um, Luke, one thing we do know about other animal species, which are less complex, is that in their wiring is deception anyway. I don't know. We might be making a, dis- a distinction between deception, a spider that pretends to be something other than what yes. it is, or a hawk that pretends to be a less predatory right. vulture or something like that. But, but Luke, one thing that you your research does suggest is that animals with less complex wiring are not truthful. Um, yep. So we see this across a huge number of species. I mean, if you look at other primates, I mean, they they engage in deception all the time. And it would seem that the basic psychological understanding that we have is also there. So, I mean, there's some fantastic anecdotes, uh, one in particular of a bonobo who is in captivity, he loved to eat wild mushrooms um, when he'd go outside and his keepers would try to avoid letting him do this because they could be poisonous. Um, so what he would do is pick them up between his toes and wait till there was a tree between him and the keepers and then eat the mushrooms. And he got so good at deceiving the keepers and hiding his eating of the mushrooms that eventually he would taunt them and wait for them to arrive and eat the mushrooms right in front of them. Um, so I think this kind of, it's clear that at least in primates, there's there's quite complex lying happening. And we see lying in spiders as well, where often they'll, a male spider will give a gift to a female before mating. And so usually this is another insect wrapped up in silk, but some spiders um, will give fake gifts. They'll just give a ball of silk um, to deceive the females into mating with them. So I think it, it's widespread in nature across, I mean, from the most complex to the most simple animals. There's some kind of horrifying analogy that I could draw from there to Match.com, but I, I uh, discretion <laughs> dis- discretion forbids that. I, we're at a point where I can't ask another question, which is too bad because I have hundreds of questions I want to ask. I want to thank Michael Lynch, professor of philosophy at UConn, University of Connecticut, uh, Luke McNally from Trinity College in Dublin, also Ralph Kais, uh, author of Post-Truth Era, and Sam Harris, author of Lying and the Moral Landscape. Especially want to thank Josh Nalea for coming up with this show and doing such a great job with it. But then the world's lots larger than it looks today And if my bad luck ever blows me back this way Well, I just look in my book of liars for your name You know I'm gonna look in the book of liars You can fool some of the people all the time and all the people some of the time, but you cannot fool all the people all the time. You know who said that? Genghis Khan. 
1997, the year I got my master's degree in nanotechnology from the University of Constantinople. I swear it. 